Hello. My name is Panos Juriadis. I work for SUSE, QA Maintenance, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about serverless and open FAS. Um, first thing is, how many of you do you know what Kubernetes is and you have set up and bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster? Please just raise your hand. Okay, thank you very much. Well, not that many people. Um, this talk basically implies that you're already, already familiar with uh, Kubernetes and microservices, although uh, fear not, I will uh, try to give my best to make it as simple as possible, abstract it for everybody here at the conference to understand uh, um, this kind of new notion uh, for serverless, since it's the next step. So, um, what is serverless? It's kind of funny name. Serverless is when I come to your server room and steal your servers. Not really. I mean, um, a few uh, months ago, uh, Kelsey Hightower, who is uh, quite a famous uh, uh, persona in the Kubernetes world, uh, made a joke in Twitter and uh, said, you know, serverless, if you have no servers, then the only thing you can deploy there is a codeless application. So just for fun, what he did is um, he created this Git repository uh, which, ha which has no code and getting started, started by not writing any code. Building application, this is how you build your application. Deploying it, it's simple, right? And you don't have to contribute. The funny thing is that uh, the community of Kubernetes and serverless really like this. As you can see, 20,000 people uh, really start the project. It, it has 1,000 issues. Uh, let's see some of the issues, uh, what issues we can have here. Uh, yeah, licenses, uh, code doesn't run, bad performance on Windows 10, where it is. I mean, good job Microsoft, that's a nice achievement. Um, so, and even if this is not enough, I don't know if you know a guy called Brown, uh, Richard Brown packaged it. And I remember talking to him, and he was like, uh, uh, Panos, you don't believe how hard it is to build something in build service that has absolutely no code inside. <laughs> so it seems like everybody uh, in the community really likes this joke. So I was, let's create some buzz here in the Open Source Conference. So I would like to welcome you to the first worldwide uh, serverless, uh, sorry, presentationless presentation, which is just a talk. Meaning like I have empty slides, absolutely empty slides. There are no slides. Yet, here I am, here we are, so we have a presentation, but also we don't have at the same time. The same thing with servers. We deploy stuff, but we say we don't have them. So. Let's start. Um, I assume that even though most people are not familiar with Kubernetes, I'm sure you are all familiar with deploying an instance or instances, uh, spawning them, uh, shutting them down, uh, SSH into your instances, debug what went wrong, and at some point in time, this time when this right, you update your instances and everything. I assume everybody should be familiar with that. All these things that feels familiar to a sysadmin are not happening in serverless. In serverless, the developer is focused only on his application. Uh, the company pays only for what is used. It's very easy to debug the problem because everything is uh, stripped down and individualized into functions, and the updates are seamlessly happening in some seconds. So, 
I will take you back and talk a little bit about the progression of computing. Years ago, like in this big room, let's say we had computers that were filling this room. Big mainframes, very hard to maintain, very hard to change, very expensive, not that powerful. Then, today, we basically live in the uh, times that we have pocket-sized uh, computers. You all have smartphones, you all know what Raspberry Pis are. Uh, although, it seems that this is not enough. We still need some space to place those machines, right? We still need a server room. A couple of years ago, actually, uh, if you want to expand your infrastructure, you had to rent another room to buy servers, to pay for, electri for, for the air conditioning, for the electricity, and all those things. So what happened next, as the next step in the evolution, is we discovered virtual machines. So in the same machine, in the same server, we sliced it up in virtual machines. So we don't uh, um, uh, um, need more space for more servers in that case. The problem with virtual machines is that they actually, you don't realize that they exist. I mean, in a bare metal physical server, you, you, you see it, you can touch it. In, when I see a server, uh, I don't know how many virtual machines are inside or something like that. So in order to realize that a virtual machine exists is only when it is online, right? Only when it has an IP I, that I can ping in something. Otherwise, I have no information of the existence of this instance. Um, the virtual machines, in order to be online, they have to boot. So we treat them as a normal computer in that case, which means that we have to wait for boot time. Um, then the next step in the evolution is containers. Containers are, let's say, um, smaller virtual machines, not that good isolated, but they have two interesting characteristics. Characteristics number one, number one is that they are smaller. When we think of containers, we think of megabytes. When we think of QCOW images, we think of gigabytes, usually. And the second thing is that the containers can start and stop in milliseconds. So we can immediately understand that this thing is online, while in, in a virtual machine we have to wait to boot. Okay? And apparently, we live in times that people say that the best way to deploy a web app or any app is inside the container. And how would you do that? Well, Google gave us the solution in that case, uh, which is Kubernetes. Now it's an open source project, and what Kubernetes is, is uh, the guy that basically manages your containers, stops them, replicates them, skill them, heal them. He is the administrator of your containers in that case. What is the problem with, with Kubernetes? The problem uh, is that how many of you are, for, let's say, developers? You know how to write code? All of you, perfect. So how many of you, you know how to do an average workflow in Kubernetes, meaning? You know how to, to deploy a Docker uh, image, uh, to send it to the, re to the registry, to write a spec file for your deployment, to write a spec file for your service, if it's going to be a service, and then use an ingress controller. Not that many of you that you raised your hand before. I think only two people raised your hand. So as you can see, the developers today, they have to be Kubernetes administrators first, and then developers. And there are some people and say, you know, I know how to write Python, but I don't really care where my code is going to run. I don't want to maintain that server. So can this be a little bit easier, I mean? And the second thing is, uh, now we are in an integration period of many people are uh, converting their big monoliths into microservices. And what is happening, it, what, what is going to happen and what is happening for the companies that have already been there is like they end up with having, let's say, 100 microservices in the in, in infrastructure. And then while they monitor them, they realize that, you know, from these 100, we actually use five of them and the rest, not that much. But they have to pay for 100. They have to pay CPU resources, storage, and everything for the 100, even though they use just five of them. So 
how this can be a little bit simpler for the developer and how this can be a little bit more efficient uh, cost-wise. And you have to think like that. Uh, I told you before to pay attention to the characteristics of the containers, which are smaller and faster. What if we go the next step in the architecture design, I don't know, and say that we split the microservice, which is already small enough, we split it into functions, so all those functions all together, they consist of the microservice. Uh, the, the, the characteristic of a function is that it's a small piece of code, and usually it executes pretty fast. So, small container, small piece of code, fast container, fast execution time. If you combine this, you have serverless. Meaning, if I can spawn a container that fast, when the user asks me to do it, the user is not going to realize that this thing was dead before, right? I mean, he asks for it, he gets it. The delay is less than 10 milliseconds. He's not going to realize that this thing is not running. So, what's the reason of having this thing running in the first place and costing me money? None. And this is why serverless is so popular today, because it saves you money. And how much money, you may ask? Um, let's see, I was checking some articles. Uh, let's look this. From 10,000, they dropped down to 370. Uh, and here the article has some, uh, some graphs and other stuff. The thing is, in average, you can cost, you can de de decrease your cost down to 70%, minimum and maximum 90%. And this is why everybody likes that, because they save a lot of money, like literally a lot. They just pay what they use. They don't have anything running, and because there is no service running, this is why they call it serverless, like there is no server running in the first place. It goes up only when you guys need it. The second thing um, is that, ah, actually, since I have a presentation, this presentation, let me go to the correct slide, number five. Okay. Um, and um, let's talk a little bit about what serverless means. It's all about point of view. Okay. From the point of view of the developer, the developer just writes a function and then it sends that function to uh, Kubernetes or the serverless infrastructure and his function is going to scale, is going to be maintained by somebody else. In other words, servers do exist. Of course they exist. It's just not your servers. It's somebody else's problem to solve in that case. That's the whole thing, wow. Uh, from the point of view of uh, managers that they deal with uh, money and stuff, they see the benefit of the cost, that they reduce the cost. They don't have to have any virtual machine, bare metal, or even containers running 24-7. These things are running only when it's needed, so you pay only what you use. In that case, from the point of view of uh, the uh, um, um, from the point of view of the administrators, well, the administrators have to administer something. Tough luck, guys, not serverless for you. There is a server there. Although, you can do a lot of stuff with Kubernetes nowadays. And uh, uh, basically, as soon as you have a deployment there, Kubernetes can basically auto-scale your deployment. And I will show you a live demo uh, later on how Kubernetes can auto-scale this. It can self-heal your pods. If something goes down, Kubernetes will understand that and automatically spawn another pod for you. So the typical administrator thing is there, but it has a lot of help from the system. And from the user perspective or the customer perspective, they don't realize any difference. They, act, they have access in their services. Um, um, just to give you an example, if you go and buy Coca-Cola from these uh, uh, fridges that you swipe your card, 
what happens is that by the time you swipe your card, there is a serverless Lambda uh, function from AWS, from AWS that makes the transaction. So Coca-Cola so Coca as a company in that case, they pay for this service only when you pay for a, a cola in that case. Um, so the next question is, all, th all those things seems to be really uh, fine and great, then why everybody's using this, right? Why you say that good things and we are not really see people using this? Well, uh, first thing is it's a very new technology and uh, with every technology, now is the time that this technology is actually cost effective. The same thing what happens with uh, every uh, te technological product. Do you remember 10 years ago the uh, CRT monitors, real big ones, and the LCDs were really expensive? So now it's time for this thing to, like, you have relatively cheap cloud infra infrastructure, relatively cheap computers also, power, and all those things. The problem also with that is, because it's new, it's not mature enough, and people are not going to replace what they make money with, with something which is relatively new. Uh, Amazon and uh, other uh, services, Google, Azure, and other uh, cloud providers, they want to boost this, so they give you for free. You say it, for example, AWS gives you one million calls for free. One million consoles, a lot. So you, you, you can play, you can study that, you can Google for tutorials and stuff without costing you money. Uh, but even though the problem is that there are no tools around this thing. So for example, many people that use Amazon, they also use uh, the dashboard for monitoring. So you start to, you know, I need this, what tool providing this, that, and it's not really solid, let's say, yet. And um, this is why one year before the Linux Foundation, the CNCF, made this as a project and they tried to uh, standardize the format because there are so many serverless uh, frameworks in that case. Uh, we have... Um, we have serverless, yeah, not that uh, a unique name. We have Nucleo, we have uh, Fission, we have Kubeless, we have uh, Kubeless, by the way, uh, since we're in university, if there are students playing with machine learning, this is what they use in machine learning uh, nowadays quite a lot, and uh, also Apache OpenWhisk. The one that we're going to talk about today is OpenFAS. But you see there are many implementations and people start to get uh, dizzy with all things. So the CNCF group said, you know, let's standardize things. And um, quite recently in uh, KubeCon, they actually made the very first uh, draft. You see the version is 0 0.1. So they try to have a specification like what, in, what a, an event is going to be like, how your JSON is going to be like, and all those things to make sure that everybody is not going wild and crazy uh, and try to um, standardize all, all the things. So, okay, this is serverless, and how you are going to use it in that case with functions. And Function as a service is the technology that developers are going to use to write functions that they pass them to the serverless infrastructure and have what we exactly said before. So um, let's try to have a demo in that case. Um, in that case, I'm using um, Minikube because uh, unfortunately, um, Everything else seems to be uh, broken in OpenSUSE when it comes to Kubernetes. Um, yeah, if you are using Kubernetes, please make me a favor and file bug reports. Uh, start using it. We have Cubic. 
Uh, later on today, Richard Brown and Alexander Herzig here is going to give you a presentation about this. We need people, guys. We need the community to embrace the things in OpenSUSE and start be active. We cannot have uh, broken stuff when it comes to uh, te latest technologies like that. Uh, we really need your help. Um, so, for this one, let me switch to a terminal. Okay. So, let me see where I have my notes. Okay. So, for those of you that you are new to Kubernetes, the first thing that you are going to find is Minikube. Minikube is similar to Hello World in every other programming language. It's the easiest and simplest way to deploy your cluster within a minute or so, or, if, or if even less. And truth to be told, it's not going to be a real cluster. It's going to be a single node cluster. I would like to have Cube ADM here to show you how you can have multiple clusters, but it doesn't work at the moment. And even with Minikube, I had to use the Go binaries from the upstream. So Minikube is a little bit uh, grumpy, and by default it uses VirtualBox, and I don't really want to use VirtualBox in my Linux machine, so I use KVM. Uh, in, in case you would like to do the same, uh, you can go to my blog, uh, yeah, it's not that difficult, the URL. It's my uh, first name and my last name. Uh, <laughs> and you can find this article, and there I have the KVM configuration that you guys are going to need in order for Minikube uh, to use KVM and libvirt in that case. So let me take this command. Open a new terminal. Do I have another one open already? Ah, I had it open already. Okay. So make dear open SUSE conference 18. Let's go into the conference. Uh, Minikube. This will take some time and, the, and what it will do basically, it will download a QCOW image I hope the Wi-Fi will uh, be okay with that and automatically configure Kubernetes for you uh, in your case. Um, while this is happening, let's discuss some things. Uh, I suppose some of you, you, al you already have some applications and you would like to port them in this new kind of thing. What you will need? Uh, you will probably need to switch to JavaScript uh, mo most of the people don't really like it. It's not that it doesn't work with other programming languages. Many people also use Python and other, Ruby also. But for me, at that moment, uh, it seems like JavaScript has the best tooling around those things. Second thing you have to consider is that you have completely destroyed your mid layer in your application. The whole logic has to be in functions in order to be able to scale. The third thing, you have to find a serverless friendly framework. Um, I recommend you uh, where it is, the Vue.js, if I have it here, but I can also Google it, Vue.js. Um, this is a friendly framework for that stuff. Uh, okay, Vue.js, maybe it's not, ah, it's org, okay. I went with a better domain in that case, view.js. <laughs> okay, uh, and you see here it says uh, function as a service platform library. Uh, no, you don't see it. Uh, yes, here. So it's better to start with something friendly uh, for you. And uh, the last thing that I would like to mention here is security. Security, security, security. Uh, one 
out of five serverless apps has a critical security vulnerability. Why? Because most people are copy and paste stuff from tutorials. And this is a new technology, so in, um, they just, okay, let's do that, and they end up with having passwords and secrets in Kubernetes, in GitHub, and uh, other stuff. Uh, then you have to actually familiarize yourself with uh, JSON web tokens. That's how the authentication works. So do me a favor, and before really st uh, starting doing this, just study how the authentication works there. Okay. Um, let's see, first list. Okay, we have it running, that's good. So, let's see, uh, kubectl cluster info. Okay, our cluster is there. kubectl get pods. Ah, let's see the namespaces first, get namespaces. So uh, by default, uh, Minikube creates for you three namespaces in that case. Uh, if we look what is happening in the um, namespace of Cube system, uh, get pod, I have to get the pod. Uh, it already has created these pods for you, and as you can see, it, it has already created a, um, a dashboard in order, if you don't like terminal, you can also do all those things graphically, basically, and we are going to see the service running there. Uh, the service is using node port, uh, for the networking, so it's already set up, and the port is uh, 30,000. Now we need to find the actual port that we want to use, so um, as the IP of the machine, sorry. So um, describe port and describe this one. And here, we get the description of what is happening. And somewhere here it should say node, yes, node here. So this is the IP that I'm going to use in order to access my service in that case at port 30,000, I think, right? Yeah, one, two, three. So this is the default uh, dashboard you get with Minikube in that case. So the same thing that you can query from the command line, you can do it also here. So we just change the namespace, for example, to cube system, and you see uh, here that we can see the pods, the deployments, the replica sets, the services running, and all those things. So next thing, in order to install uh, OpenFuzz, we are going to use a Kubernetes package manager. Kubernetes package manager is Helm. So uh, I'm going to do Helm uh, init. Okay, and what is happening now is that it's going to deploy a service on the Kubernetes side in order to uh, com to, com to communicate. The service is called Tile Tyler. So let's see again. You see Tyler deploy here. Uh, here. Let me basically do this, and let's see if the service is already, if the pod is running or is preparing to run. Tyler, yeah, it's running, perfect. So now if I do Helm, um, what, Helm? Uh, let me see my notes. Yeah, Helm version. It actually tries to com tries to communicate. Here is Helm. Here is Tyler. In that case, so Helm can communicate with our Kubernetes cluster. We can use a package manager to install easily web uh, apps and cube apps. Meaning, if you go to uh, cube apps here, uh, here there are 189. Uh, 
packages for Kubernetes that you can basically install with one click in a microservice way. So you just type what you want, you run the command and it's installed. Seems similar to Zipper in that case. So now that we have everything installed, uh, everything ready, you need to have a Kubernetes infrastructure. That was the, fir the first step, the prerequisite. Now let's, going, let's go to, in to install OpenFAS. Um, you, you go to this directory in uh, GitHub, and here we have uh, some information. Uh, first, you need to create something is beeping here. I don't know. Uh, you have to create uh, a namespace for that, and it's all, always good to create namespaces for your deployments. So let's create a namespace for OpenFAS pods, and let's create a different one for OpenFAS functions. So a different one for the uh, framework and a different for the functions. And then, uh, because Kubernetes 1.10 is using Air Airbag as an authentication method, um, we are going also to uh, deploy it using authentication method Airbag. I mean this Airbag true here. Uh, it's a good practice to use authentication in general. So, what? Needs list name. Ah, yes, of course, I need to clone the repository first. Sorry for that. So, the repository we need to clone. Was it here? Yes. So, come on, Wi Fi. I need you just for a few kilobytes. You can do it. Thank you. Okay, Fastnitis, Fastnitis, all the names have to be fancy. Uh, and we go into the uh, charts. Charts is the specification for the, de for, for the deployment. Uh, so if I go inside here, uh, you can read, this is the deployment in that case, this is the file. Right, this is what uh, Shemel is going to to use. So, what again? Ah, ah, yes. Thank you, guys. So. Already. Uh, things happening here. These are the services that OpenFAS deploys. It also deploys Prometheus for you to give you some monitoring. And uh, let's see here if the service is up and running. Okay. kubectl get pods namespace uh, OpenFAS. Why I had to have an error? Just why? This is not good. Let me um, show you how you can change that. Um, so we did that. It worked. We did that. It worked. So, in case it doesn't work like you for the first, let's delete it and do it again. <laughs> let's see if it's fixed. Ah, now it's working. So, Kubernetes self healing things. Live. That's even better, actually. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what we need? We need the IP of the gateway. Uh, Let's find that. Oh no, we, we know the IP because we have just one pod. So we need the uh, port that this thing is running. So services, so as the service. Um, it's in this port. So 
where was the Kubernetes thingy here? Okay. And I can also see the same thing from here because I told you you can see the same things from the uh, web, from the dashboard. Let me go to OpenFast in that case. Let me go to services. Um, services. Let's find the uh, um, gateway external. And here you can see the port also from here. So this is the web uh, UI of OpenFAS, uh, plain simple. And you just click, I mean, for your first uh, steps, you, uh, you can just click to deploy a new function. And here there is a GitHub repository with some functions that people have contributed into f just for fun. Uh, and you can just click and have it installed. For example, if you would like to check for SSL certification, and by clicking uh, here at the links, you can see the GitHub repository for those things. So what is inside this container in that case? Uh, information how you can invoke the function and all that stuff. So by clicking deploy, it has deployed it here. And let's see if it's actually so now we are going to the namespace of fn and get uh, the pod here. So we see that it's running. This is good. And let's use it. Let's see the certificate of opensuse.org in that case. So it ran and it, and it gave us that the opensuse.org certificate is going to expire in two years from now, for example. This is a simple function. This thing is not alive, it's dead. It goes up only when I click the invoke button. That's the whole serverless thingy. I can call it uh, also from the command line in that case. Um, I can uh, either use curl or I can also uh, uh, use um, a command line binary for open fast called fast CLI. So, Let's try this, but I have to change the IP to the correct one, which is 55. Okay, 55. The OpenFAS website seems to end up in two weeks from now. So they, these guys have to fix their certificate in two, in two weeks from now. So this is how you call it with a kettle. Uh, do, do you need to zoom? Yeah, is it everybody okay? Okay, cool. I think here is better. And you can also use the um, uh, fast CLI uh, command line. Uh, you can find more information by visiting uh, the uh, open fast GitHub repository, how to do it, but these are the basic instructions in that case. And you can just uh, call it like that. Echo, yes, 55. So this, the same thing, just using the binary in case you don't have curl available, but you have this, I don't know. Um, what else? Uh, let's also create a function of our own. Let me, how much time do we have? Okay, we don't have much time. We have just five minutes, but we're also a little bit late. So I'm going to demo, because I would like really to demo you the, um, the auto-scaling function. So let's go directly to that. Um, okay, let me open two windows, in that case. And I need the IP of Prometheus, the port of Prometheus, not the IP. Uh, not UI. This is uh, Prometheus running for us for free in that case. So let's uh, see the rate of this. Like, okay. 
Hmm? Maybe I did something wrong. Okay, total. Ah, I have to look at the graph. So we just call uh, this function where it is uh, here three th three times. We call it th th three times. One from the web UI and two times from the terminal. So we have just one a replica running or one replica available when we're going to use it in that case. And the auto-scaling scheme that we have here, if we go to alerts, here it says that if I start calling this, if there is traffic using this function uh, more than five times in less than, or in 10 seconds, then Kubernetes will auto-scale this. So let's brute force it. Why not? So let's do while this is true, do this. Now we're going to create a seed load of traffic into this one. So you see here that the invocation count is going to uh, get bigger and bigger. And uh, here at Prometheus, uh, Let's see if we actually hit that. Maybe the function is not that fast in that case. Hmm. So my laptop seems that it, it can handle this one. It's not that fast to, to need to create another pod. Let's create another function in, in that case that it's more fast, doesn't need that much of time. Yeah, this one, my, my laptop seems to be fine with this one. Interesting, I have four gigs of RAM. Okay, um, so let's stop this one and let's create another one which is really faster. Um, so, uh, pum, 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 pum. not here, not here also. Ah, yes, I have this information in my in my blog because I would like you to read my blog also. So, uh, yes, you go again to my blog and you click uh, basically to the OpenFAS article so you can find more information in depth here that we don't have time to show you right now about how you can write your functions in that case. So, um, let's create a very simple function. Um, where it is, uh, I think it's called strong has. Yeah. So we go back to the web interface, which is where, somewhere, ah, it's further away. Okay. It's, I really have to fix my tabs. Okay, deploy a new function. Now we're going to deploy a new functions manually from uh, Docker Hub. You, you can push your function in Docker Hub and you can just put them there. So, um, and now, yeah, I need my blog, crap. So, we're going to use this function, this, this uh, Docker image, Alpine in that case. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this one. Then let's create a function name like strong has. And the binary that we are going to use in that case, it's this binary. So a function can actually be just a binary, guys. If you just need uh, to play with that, it's the easiest way to do it. And for the network, there is the default option of func functions. This is the default network that this thing wants to have there. Um, so deploy. And it got deployed. So if I write some text, blah, 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 this will create a, a has from that. Ah, the function is still building, yeah, now. You see this is the has, so let's call this function in that case um, multiple times. So it 
Yeah, this is not the IP. Okay, it works. So while true, this is really fast. It doesn't have to visit the website and do the whole thing. So also that the Wi-Fi was a little bit slow. So uh, Kubernetes was able to do all those things without really a problem. Yeah, do, do this. So now we are creating traffic. I hope so, strong has. Let's see. Uh, strong has here. Yes, already. Okay, this is going way faster. So let's see. Ah, yes, we hit it. You see that it's pending. The system realized that something is taking too much traffic, normal than usual, and it activated here. Or you see, now it's going to get firing. Yes. Firing means like Kubernetes now it's going to auto scale the thing because we actually try to kill, to brute force it. So we are in 1,500 already uh, calls, and Kubernetes scaled that four times, meaning it created four different deployments. And if we had a normal cluster, not a single node cluster, it might be that one node is in uh, USA, one node is Beijing, one node is, so you have uh, HA in that case. Um, our time is up. Uh, I would say, for more information, you can talk to me after the, uh, um, the, 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 the talk, and you can also visit my website, uh, because I have a blog ab about that, and also you can go here, serverless.lol, this is the site, and you can judge if it makes sense for your applications to put them in serverless or, or not. And with that, thank you guys very much for being here.